This is a production of PBS Charlotte. Just ahead on Carolina Impact, it's the leading cause of blindness for older Americans. Find out what it is and what you can do to delay its progression. Plus, you've been downtown, uptown, whatever. You've been to the Blumenthal Performing Arts Center, right? Who's Blumenthal? I'm Suzanne Stevens, and we'll find out coming up. And searching for a new wardrobe? Forget the mall. The latest trends may be coming your way in a truck. Don't go anywhere. Carolina Impact starts right now. Carolina Impact, covering the issues, people, and places that impact you. This is Carolina Impact. Good evening. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Amy Burkett. We begin with a topic that impacts everyone our ability to see. I can't even imagine what it would be like to lose my sight. Macular degeneration is the number one cause of vision loss for people 60 years and older. According to the American Academy of Ophthalmology, 10 to 15 million people deal with it. As Carolina Impact's Jeff Rivenbark reports, advances in eye care offer great hope. For people with vision loss, a trip to the DMV can feel a little like Mission Impossible. At 75, Frank Massey prefers driving himself, but five years ago, he started noticing something unusual. There's a blind spot just got dead center of your eye. And soon, things got worse. Glanced down my speedometer and I noticed the needle on it. I couldn't see it. So I thought I had cataract problems. Optometrist Dr. Edward Paul diagnoses lots of patients with age-related macular degeneration. What it literally does is it steals or causes blindness dead center of a person's eyesight. So a person with macular degeneration still preserves their peripheral vision or their side vision, but they cannot see centrally. As many as 11 million people in the United States have some form of age-related macular degeneration. This is not something that can be corrected with standard eyeglasses or standard contact lenses. This is a disease process that, if not treated appropriately, is going to ultimately cause blindness. V, D. It's frustrating. It really is. At 90, Neva Staley gets upset when she can't do certain things anymore. I can't read the newspaper, and I can't see the magazines that comes in, and I've given up the puzzles and then things like that because I can't see them. A person over the age of 50 has about a 10 to 15 percent chance of developing macular degeneration. If a family member has it, your risk factor increases to 50 percent. If a person has hypertension or elevated cholesterol and that's poorly controlled, that's going to increase their risk factor, as well as obesity or increased weight and smoking. That's why it's important to know your family history and get regular eye exams starting at age 50. Advances in eye care technology today can diagnose the condition three to seven years before symptoms show up. The sooner we can diagnose it, the better chance we have of reducing the impact on that patient's life. A relatively new FDA-approved procedure involves an IMT, or implantable miniature telescope, which functions like the telephoto lens of a camera. They're about the size of a green garden pea. And that telescope in select individuals can be implanted into one eye and it can improve their visual acuity between 200 to 300 percent. Now that's significant. Not everyone is a candidate for telescopic implant surgery. The procedure costs about $25,000 and is covered by Medicare and major medical insurance. At 44, Pacey Edwards deals with a rare genetic form of juvenile macular degeneration called Stargardt's disease. She received her diagnosis at age 28. After my first child was born, I could tell a difference in my eyes, fluctuating when I would read cards. I couldn't see quite as good reading um, simple things. Writing on the bottom of the TV, couldn't maybe read it as well. I was very scared. You can go blind. After consulting with Dr. Paul, he fitted her with a pair of high-tech glasses called Spectacle Miniature Telescopes. Her vision improved, and she was able to resume doing something she thought she'd never be able to do again. I would not be able to drive if I didn't wear my optic glasses. I would not feel comfortable. Telescopic glasses cost about $2,500, and they aren't covered by Medicare or insurance. But Pacey says her glasses are well worth it. It's just everything. It's my whole world. I drive everywhere around town. 
I go to church at night. I feel very free. If a doctor tells you a change in your eyeglass prescription won't improve your vision, Dr. Paul recommends getting a second opinion. I would say 95% of patients can be helped with some of this technology that we have today. N G V. It's been weeks since Neva Staley got her new telescopic glasses. She's happy to be able to sign her name and read her church hymnal. Frank Massey says his new telescopic glasses saves the day. As for his trip to the DMV. Oh, it went wonderful. There you go. I never thought I'd be driving again. While there's no cure for age-related macular degeneration, the right treatment can delay its progression and improve vision loss, making tasks which once seemed like mission impossible, possible. For Carolina Impact, I'm Jeff Reidenbark reporting. Thanks so much, Jeff. Here's something you might be surprised to learn. Your diet can reduce your risk of macular degeneration. So eat fruits and dark green leafy vegetables like kale, collards, and spinach every single day. Although I have to admit, those are not my favorite foods. Eat fish at least three times a week. That one's easier for me. And avoid foods with saturated fats. Let's talk a little now about nonprofit organizations throughout our region. Clearly, I'm a big fan of serving our community, and I'm extremely grateful for those folks who support the organizations providing the financial resources to make a positive impact on our community. Philanthropy makes a huge difference. Our next story helps us get to know a family who's making a difference. You've probably seen the name Blumenthal. Carolina Impact's Suzanne Stevens helps us get to know them. From hearing musicians play classic music, to watching actors perform Broadway shows, you've likely sat in the splendid surroundings or walked by it a dozen times. Although you've seen the name, do you know to whom it belongs? This is my grandfather. Philip Blumenthal and his brothers are now the third generation of Blumenthal philanthropists. You're not being a nice person or whatever, you know, or generous, which is a term I don't particularly like, you know, to do what you do in a community, you do it because it's your responsibility, your obligation to do it. And that's something passed on from his father's generation. These were the three brothers. This was my grandfather and his two brothers that came to this country. When you step inside the Blumenthal Foundation, you'll see an entire wall showcasing some of the family's photos. Philip's grandparents immigrated from Ukraine and Lithuania to escape poverty. The Blumenthal's are Jewish and have given handsomely to the Jewish community here in Charlotte. There's that name again. The thing that motivates them to give is a Jewish principle called tzedakah. It is a commandment to give. It means that you, we are all commanded to give and to give thoughtfully, to give to everyone. And the Blumenthal family has that in their DNA. Philip in particular has that. Come on in. As Chief Operating Officer of Charlotte Center City Partners, Moira Quinn works closely with many family foundations in Charlotte. The Blumenthal Family Foundation is one of the most important because they have invested in many large ways and in many small ways. And sometimes the really small investments are the ones that make the biggest impact. And Philip Blumenthal says that's exactly the family's philosophy. We give a larger number of smaller grants. <laughs> you know, and we've done that for a long time. The Blumenthal Foundation has given away more than $25 million so far. Where does the money come from? Well, it turns out that Philip's uncle did really well with a product that fixes car radiators. Here's the story. I.D. Blumenthal is passing through Charlotte one day. His car breaks down. The guy who fixed his radiator used a special product. And Mr. Blumenthal was so impressed that he joined the company and eventually bought it. This, we think, is the, it was the original product. It's a powder to stop leaks in the radiator. And over the years, the company added more radiator products. We use gunk, the toughest. Plant. Perhaps you've heard of gunk. Well, the company behind gunk is Radiator Specialty. Back at the Blumenthal Foundation headquarters, there's another photo gallery dedicated to the history of Radiator Specialty. But this was the 50th anniversary in 1974 of the founding of the company. Philip has been recognized at the highest state level with all kinds of awards. He knows his family is fortunate, but he says they're not the only fortunate ones in Charlotte. So it's been frustrating. I mean, I've seen it and I know a lot of other people that spend time. I mean, it gets to be where it's not pressure, but sort of the known funding sources get hit for just about everything that goes on. 
He's saying he'd like to see others step up. Yes, I am saying that. Yeah, exactly what I'm saying. I'm saying that there's, and it, and it could be, and I, it would be an enjoyable thing for them to do that. See, you gotta get him! With the spotlight recently on Charlotte because of civil unrest, shootings, and protests, many want a new focus on equity and some sort of progress to help people climb out of poverty. And we're going to have to invest and do the hard work to fix these problems, and it means all of us are going to have to step up and do it. And we're going to look to our, our foundations, we're going to look to our philanthropic community to help us do it. What I think Charlotte needs to develop more of is a giving ethic, you know, again, back to what I said at the very beginning, that it's expected of you, because this community has been good to a lot of people, you know, very good. The Blumenthal's hold a family meeting twice a year. They talk about their company, they talk about their projects, and their giving. And the next generation is very involved. They will take over the foundation, the mission, and the legacy. For Carolina Impact, I'm Suzanne Stevens. Thanks so much, Suzanne. Even though it's easy to associate the Blumenthal name with the arts, Philip Blumenthal's main passion is for the environment. He personally works on conservation and ecology projects throughout the Carolinas. Well, joining me now is Michael Marsicano, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Foundation for the Carolinas. Michael, we always appreciate your time. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you, Amy. I'm delighted to be here. You know what? We want to talk about philanthropy, and we saw mm -hmm. Philip as an example there. Mm -hmm. In this story, he was encouraging others to step up to the plate. There's always more to be done, correct? Absolutely. There's a lot of need out there and a lot of opportunity, and this is a generous community, but it can be more generous. So let's talk a little bit about how generous it is. Mm -hmm. The Foundation for the Carolinas is one of the fastest growing community foundations in the country, as I understand, and you, be, you keep climbing every year. Where are you these days? It is. We have grown from the 35th largest a few years back to the 8th largest in the United States, and that's a testament to the generosity of the folks in this region. Help people understand, because I think a lot of people don't realize how a community foundation can make a difference in their community mm -hmm. and how it can be transformational. Talk to us a little bit about how all the different funds, people can set up individual funds, mm -hmm. but it can make a big difference. Well, community foundations are really uh, a collaboration of many different funds. Uh, in Charlotte, we have 2,500 different funds, and about half of those are funds set up by families, it's very easy to do. Families will set up a fund and then through that fund support uh, charities and philanthropic causes over time. Uh, corporations have funds at the foundation, uh, as do nonprofits themselves have their endowments at the foundation. So we're kind of a full service center for philanthropy and we try to make it very easy by having uh, one infrastructure that everybody can uh, use. I think there's confusion about how much do I need to start a, a family foundation? Mm -hmm. Well, at, the, at Foundation for the Carolinas, we will open a fund for a family at $10,000. Uh, it does not have to stay at $10,000. Some folks will open a fund at $10,000 and immediately start making grants from that fund. So our funds range from everywhere from 10000 to in the tens of millions. And one of the things that we know, while there's a lot of disparity in our community, mm -hmm. there's very wealthy and unfortunately not uh, as wealthy, there's still capacity to make a difference. There is capacity, and it's very interesting. Uh, people of more modest incomes actually give a higher percentage of their income to philanthropic causes than do folks of more uh, significant means. Uh, in Charlotte, uh, we've been ranked as the second in the country in giving and volunteering, which is quite a feather in our cap. But when you look at that giving, it's a very um, um, broad pyramid. There are a lot of folks giving a lot of modest gifts to support causes. But we're still fairly uh, um, young in large gifts going to uh, major uh, transformational opportunities. Those are increasing uh, over time, and I, I'm very forward-looking to see that it will be plentiful in the future. Let's talk about tax benefits as well for mm -hmm. the person making the donations. Mm -hmm. Well, what's very interesting about this great American policy we have is that when you give to a charitable enterprise, uh, you get a tax deduction uh, that would have gone to the government. And this is the great thing about philanthropy in the United States. We as Americans can uh, take uh, the need of others in our hands and help them in ways we think um, uh, our best, and Uncle Sam gives us a tax deduction for doing it. It's really quite extraordinary, and, and really we were the first in the world to actually do that. And you know 
that your finances make a difference where you live, work, and play. Absolutely, because uh, when you give the money to the government, you don't know exactly where it's going to go. But when you make a check to a charitable organization that you've gotten to uh, know and understand uh, their needs, uh, you can have an impact immediately. What are the next steps, Michael? What does our community need to understand about the potential for them to make our community even better? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that most folks find their way to philanthropy through volunteer activities, and I think that we first want people to volunteer with nonprofits, and that's where they can see exactly where they fit in and where, what fits their particular interests. You mentioned Philip Blumenthal with his passion for the environment. Uh, the environment is a big issue uh, today that we need to work on, but economic opportunity and the arts and um, um, health care and public education, there is so much that needs to be done. Lots to be done, and uh, we need more help to make it happen. We do. We Michael do. Marsicano from the Foundation for the Carolinas, thank you so much for all you do for our community and for sharing your time with us uh, right now. WTVI is the best, and I'm glad to be a part of it. By now, you've probably seen food trucks all around Charlotte. Well, there's another group of entrepreneurs starting to use the same model. Instead of shopping at a brick and mortar store for clothes, now you can find the latest fashion trends on a truck. Carolina Impact's Tanisha Johnson gives us details on what began as a business trend on the West Coast seven years ago. Okay. Fashion truck owner Carlene Sitterud strapped in for the ride of her life about three years ago, leaving a nine to five job in the corporate world to start a clothing business, Curvaceous Closet. Bypassing the opportunity to open a brick and mortar, Sitterud told her husband she wanted a business on wheels. You know, I want to do a fashion truck and just drive all over and do events and home parties, stuff like that. And much to her surprise. And he looked at me and he says, I think that's a great idea. And I'm like, oh, who are you? Because <laughs> he does not like that at all. He's very practical. And so with his support and $39,000 out of pocket, her 165 square foot bread truck turned pink beast hit the streets of Charlotte within 30 days, catching lots of attention. It's so funny because you get like 6 million stares because it's bright pink. No matter where she goes, many of those stares turn to likes on social media, especially when she's sitting in rush hour traffic. And as nerve wracking as it can be to get to her next gig. And I actually just love the freedom of this job because if I don't want to work today, I don't have to. If I want to go out and park somewhere, I just can. Outfitted with clothing racks, a dressing room, and a square for payment, things could not be better. It's just becoming a hotter and hotter trend now. With a brick and mortar, you have to pay a large rent every single month, whereas a fashion truck, you have your upfront cost, but there's like no rent <laughs> afterwards. Not to mention, she doesn't have to hire or fire employees or be tied down to one location. And she gets to meet new people every day. We have our large following, so where we are, they come, <laughs> which brings economic growth to the city as far as retail and shopping. And so when they shop with us, they're going to go across the street and they're going to shop there. They might go to a club, you know, who knows? They make a day event out of it. Carissa Strickland also owns a fashion truck business. I used to have a brick and mortar boutique, um, but I like to travel and I like to do different events and festivals. Um, so I just thought, the idea of having a fashion truck was just really unique and cool. Last year, Strickland and dozens of other business owners from Virginia, North Carolina, and South Carolina took part in Charlotte's first fashion truck rally. It's really convenient, it's different. These are all different items that, that we don't get to see in Charlotte or at the mall or anything like that. So it's nice to have a variety. So Do you FYI. have this in black? No, I don't have any black left. I think when you walk around, you get to meet like the owners of the stores. It makes you a little bit more motivated to shop their brand and shop the things they offer. Shop because local. You shop local, you know you're supporting the person that you're talking to, and it just gives you a lot more um, those feel good. Since business was strong in 2016, they're planning to hold another rally this year. When these entrepreneurs aren't helping customers, there's lots of other things they have to do. Night and on the weekends, they search for the latest styles to sell, balance the books, and plan the next event. 
Jahala McCall used to own a storefront business, but now operates off the hangar out of this truck. At first, it was kind of like bittersweet because I liked going into the store. Now that I have my truck, it's, to it's paid for, so it's just maintenance. You set it up and it's done. I have a fitting room. You have the convenience and people just step in and shop. On a good day, she sold as much as $1,700 in six hours. But the mother of three admits it's tough taking on the full financial responsibility of a business. And it's been challenging sometimes because I don't have a business loan. It's just my money that I had when I was in corporate and I used my 401k. I'm doing it on my own and I don't have any debt with it. Eventually, she wants to get her logo plastered on the side of her truck. But until then, she's happy working for herself as opposed to having a corporate job. She's also glad to show her kids how hard work pays off. It's like letting them witness what I'm doing so that they can know that they can do it too and that that's something that they should strive for, to have for themselves. With her biggest cheerleaders by her side, McCall says she wouldn't trade it for the world. I worked in fashion and I studied fashion and that's what I really like. Like this is really like where my heart is. I wouldn't trade anything for the world. This is, this is my, like my dream. <laughs> and the reward of seeing one's dream grow into a successful business drives these entrepreneurs to work even harder. For Carolina Impact, I'm Tanisha Johnson reporting. Thanks so much, Tanisha. According to the latest statistics from the American Mobile Retail Association, mobile retailers spend about 74% of their personal savings to get started. And it takes about seven months to two years to recoup their investment. Well, if you're looking for great steak without the glitz, the beef and bottle may be calling your name. On this week's Carolina Cooking segment, Jason Turzes takes us inside this iconic restaurant. Take just one step inside and you'll feel like you've stepped back in time. The Rat Pack is here. So is Marilyn, Lucille, Rita, Liz, Elvis, and a slew of others. I like the music. I, I like the decor. The Beef and Bottle is just as it ever was. Beef and Bottle is a, an anniversary place, a special place. Um, now, any day could be special. Wood paneling, low ceilings, and a very dark interior give this place its own distinctive vibe. I think it's something that, for the most part, you don't find a lot anymore. And it's for that reason, and several others, that this place has become a true Charlotte institution. The customers all feel that there's something different here. Beef and Bottle has three very distinct dining rooms. The yes. main dining room, the back patio, and a small room wedged in between. The most coveted spot, a booth in the main dining room. Each has a celebrity picture. Hello, Robert Goulet. Our booths are very, very popular. Each table has a white tablecloth, candle, and fresh cut flowers. Reservations are even taken the old fashioned way with a pencil and paper. Outside, if you didn't know the restaurant was here, you might zip right on by it. Beef and Bottle uh, was a, a roadhouse in the days when South Boulevard was uh, the, the, the big highway out of town. The same beige siding and red trim covers the building just like it did when it opened in 1979. But don't let the drab looks fool you. The food is second to none. All of our, our beef has is, is got to be aged. And we're aged at least 21 days. All of our beef is, U is USDA choice or higher. What sets Beef and Bottle steaks apart is how they're prepared. We cook the steaks in a different manner than a lot of other businesses. First, garlic butter goes on the flat top grill. Then the steak gets put on to get seared. More garlic butter goes on top, followed by seasoned salt. And within 30 seconds or so, the steak is flipped to sear the other side. The searing sears in the uh, juices and the flavor, uh, natural flavor of the beef. After being seared, the steak is moved to the regular grill, where medium steaks are cooked for roughly four minutes on each side before being served. You get a, an entree, but it comes with salad and a side. It's not everything a la carte, so it is a very good value. Beef and Bottle dates back to 1958. After running another restaurant, original owner George Fine opened the House of Steaks on North Tryon Uptown. Back then, you could get a sirloin for $3.75, a small filet for four and a quarter, a large filet for $5.95. At that time, basically, 
the, we didn't have any of the chain restaurants, and it was really the number one steakhouse in town. In 1978, citing eminent domain, the city of Charlotte forced House of Steaks to close in order to build Discovery Place. A year later, the restaurant reopened on South Boulevard. It was renamed Beef and Bottle. George Fine wanted to create an old school vibe. He thought that was the type of atmosphere that would lend itself to a successful steakhouse. A place that would look like a New York or Chicago mobster hangout. He was thinking old school even at that time. He was thinking the classics, you know, the classic dark interior. That's why the lighting's dark. Through the 80s and 90s, Beef and Bottle enjoyed years of success. But after the original Hornets moved out of the nearby Charlotte Coliseum and chain steakhouses started popping up all over town, business started falling off. I took a phone call. The people asked me if we had chicken on the menu. You know, he said no, and he had six people, and this was in the recession, yeah. you know, and I said, my God, we just turned away 200 plus dollars because we didn't have a piece of chicken on the menu. 22 new items were then added to the menu. We increased the size of our, our shrimp, we increased the size of our lobster, we increased the size of our portions, and we did not increase any prices. Customers old and new started showing up. Business picked up so much, the original kitchen built in the 60s couldn't keep up. So in 2015, the restaurant closed for three weeks to rip out, renovate, and expand. And it's 1,100 square foot bigger, just the kitchen part. While the kitchen got its state-of-the-art makeover, the exterior and dining rooms were left untouched. That was a decision that, that we were going to keep the image that we have. And whether it be cheesy or sketchy or whatever people want to think of the place, that's what they want. It's always been very good, but you know, it's, it's the total environment that I, I so much enjoy. Beef and Bottle has many regulars who sit at the same table on the same weeknight with the same servers. Sometimes we get here twice a week. Visiting celebrities sometimes have to battle with regulars and usually lose. Singer Bobby Brown was once turned away at the door because he didn't have a reservation and the place was full. And there was the time a few years ago when rapper producer P. Diddy wanted to rent out the whole place. He was told no because it would be an inconvenience to regular guests. Beef and bottle, old school on the outside, new school in the kitchen, always grilled to perfection. For Carolina Impact, I'm Jason Turzis Report. Thanks so much, Jason. The original founder and owner, George Fine, died in 2009. Today, the restaurant has three partners who own and manage it. Here's a little trivia for you. Beef and bottle holds the oldest active liquor license issued in our state, number 34. Well, if you haven't done it already, please friend us on Facebook. You'll find lots of great behind the scenes videos from some of your favorite shows and you'll have a chance to win monthly prizes. Well, thanks so much for joining us. We always appreciate your time and we look forward to seeing you back here again next time on Carolina Impact. Good night, my friends. of PBS Charlotte.